Welcome to Geoscience Australia's Wednesday seminar series. My name is Andrew Heap, and I am the Chief of Minerals, Energy and Groundwater Division here at Geoscience Australia. It is with great pleasure that I welcome you to today's seminar, which focuses on the second phase of the very successful Exploring for the Future program. The seminar will be presented by myself, Ms. Christina Anastasi, and Dr. Carol Zanotta. Before I introduce my co-presenters, I want to give a little bit of context to the subject matter you'll hear about today. The Exploring for the Future program is an Australian government program led by Geoscience Australia that aims to support investment in the resources sector and agricultural sector by providing industry and land and water managers with pre-competitive data about potential mineral energy and groundwater resources. In 2016, the Australian government invested $100.5 million in the first phase of the program. And in June 2020, the government announced another $124.5 million to expand and extend the program, bringing their total investment to $225 million to date. Several key Australian government industry documents were precursors for the funding of the first phase of the program. This included the Australian government's Energy and Developing Northern Australia white papers, which set out the case that new resource discoveries and agricultural investments were key to supporting economic development in Northern Australia. Although officially published after the program commenced, discussions regarding, oh, uh, sorry, discussions regarding development of the Amira Uncover Roadmap were instrumental in helping us define our science projects and pro uh, priorities. Many of the activities we undertook in the first phase of the program and will continue into the second phase were aligned with the highest and high priorities outlined in the roadmap, including the rollout of the OzLamp, OzAM and OzArray surveys across Australia. The Australian Government continues to progress its mandate for the development of the Australia's resources sector which was endorsed by all state and territory resources ministers in 2019 under the former COAG Energy Council, now the National Cabinet. The National, Resource, the National Resources Statement sets out the, the government's policy and long-term reform agenda for the Australian resources sector. It articulates a vision for Australia to have the world's most advanced, innovative and successful resources sector that delivers sustained prosperity and development for all Australians. The five points identified on this slide are the Australian Government's long-term strategic goals, and implementing the statement remains a priority. The work we do at Geoscience Australia to identify potential new resource opportunities for investment through the provision of pre-competitive geoscience helps realise these five goals. Stemming from these goals was a, was a series of recommendations. Most notably for Geoscience Australia was the recommendation to promote resource exploration and basin development by expanding the scope of the Exploring for the Future program to be national and extending it for another four years. In the first phase of the program, we completed 21 collaborative activities and collected data and information of over more than 3 million square kilometres of Northern Australia. You'll hear a bit more about that in the upcoming uh, slides as part of the rest of the presentation. We've also had a fantastic industry response in the form of extensive new tenement uptake in greenfield regions, especially in our focus study area between Tennant Creek and Mount Isa with over 20 companies now taking up new ground. This strong industry response went a long way to convincing the Australian Government to fund the second phase of the program. And we are very grateful that the Australian Government agreed to implement this recommendation from the National Resources Statement to expand, expe expand and extend the program as announced in June. And today you'll hear more about what we have planned for the second phase of the program. I also want to thank all 25 of the research partners in government and academia who have supported us through the program. We look forward to continuing to work with them and others in the next phase. I'll now hand over to my co-presenters to tell you a little bit about the second phase of the program. But before I do, just a little bit about both of them. Christina Anastasi leads the Advice Investment Attraction and Analysis Branch in the Minerals, Energy and Groundwater Division and is Chair of the Exploring for the Future Programs Operations Committee. Prior to joining Geoscience Australia, Christina was a senior manager in the Department of Industry, Science, Energy and Resources and worked across a range of industry and resource policy and programs. Christina has represented the Australian Government internationally and on resources and energy matters and was involved in the design and administration of legislation underpinning Australia's offshore petroleum activities. Christina will be followed by Dr. Carol Zanotta, who is a senior science advisor for the Exploring for the Future program. 
Carroll joined Geoscience Australia as a graduate in 2003. He held a BSc in Applied Geology from the University of New South Wales, an MSc in Petroleum Geoscience from Royal Holloway University, London, and a PhD in Geology and Geophysics from the University of Cambridge. For the last 18 years, he has worked on minerals, energy, and groundwater resources at Geoscience Australia, and most recently was the director of the Mineral Potential of Australia section. He tells me that he is happiest when working at the interface between earth and science disciplines. So before I hand over to Carol and uh, Christina, I'll just play a short video. Minerals, energy and agriculture, now more than ever, are vital to Australia's economic growth and prosperity. Over the last four years, through the Exploring for the Future program, Geoscience Australia has applied science and technology in new ways. Gathering data unprecedented in scale and detail to understand and manage Australia's vast, valuable, untapped resources. So how do we know where to look for potential minerals, energy and groundwater buried deep underground? By analysing rock samples and water percolating up from below. Measuring signals from earthquakes and lightning strikes. Surveying and mapping with aircraft and seismic trucks. We are looking, listening, monitoring and recording what the Earth is telling us. We imaged more than 2 million square kilometres in layers hundreds of metres deep to create a picture of what's below the Earth's surface, resulting in a new generation of maps and data. Each set of data we acquire is valuable in itself, but when we overlay the data sets together in a way no one has done before, we start to see the full picture and gain a greater understanding of where we can make new discoveries. Australia has become a world leader in the science and innovation behind resource exploration. We are placing data directly into the hands of the people who need it. Explorers, investors and planners. Making a real difference to Australian communities. Our work now will drive new infrastructure, create jobs and build local economies to ensure the prosperity of future generations of Australians. Thank you, Andrew, and hello, everyone. Now, I promise not to take up too much of your time, as I know you are all here to listen to Carole to, and hear about all the exciting science and questions that, science and questions that we are aiming to answer under the Exploring for the Future program. I do, though, want to use this opportunity to provide you with a high-level overview of the motivations behind the program, including the program's importance to Australia. As we consider the motivators of the program, let me first start by re reiterating the program's intent. As you heard in the video, the program's vision is to support a strong economy, resilient society and sustainable environment for the benefit of Australians through an integrated geoscientific understanding of our mineral energy and groundwater potential. Specifically, over the next four years, the program aims to map and characterise Australia's energy and minerals resources and groundwater potential, increase Australia's attractiveness as an investment destination, support development in regional Australia and provide geoscience advice and information to government, industry and communities to inform decision making. Why is this? Well, Australia is a well known as a mining nation, so it is not surprising that our resources sector plays a vital role in our ongoing economic and social wellbeing today and into the future. Australia's resources industry represents 10% of Australia's GDP, around half of Australia's exports, and directly employs a quarter of a million people. The government's ongoing commitment to the Exploring for the Future program through its $225 million investment reaffirms the important role our industry has had in supporting Australia's economy through the coronavirus pandemic and its ongoing importance to Australia's post-COVID economic future. The Exploring for the Future program is not only looking forward to opportunities, but it is also addressing a range of challenges to ensure Australia and its people, particularly in our regional areas, continue to prosper economically and socially from our mineral energy and groundwater resources. 
Much of Australia's current resource prosperity is based on discoveries and developments from several decades ago in geologically well-known and relatively well-explored areas. As you know, it can take a decade or more for a new resource to go from discovery to development. This world-class program is expanding our understanding of the resources potential, which is hidden beneath 80% of the surface by providing new and improved pre-competitive geological data and information. This information will ultimately de-risk exploration and investment in minerals and energy, underpinning a pipeline of future resource developments, and will provide policy and decision makers with an improved and expanded understanding of Australia's groundwater resources, which not only will support future resource developments, but will inform drought resilience activities by communities and our agriculture industry. You have already heard from Andrew how the first phase of this program has addressed these challenges with great success. I also wanted to highlight the potential impact of this government's investment after the first four years. Geoscience Australia engaged ASIL Allen Consulting to undertake a return on investment analysis. This report, which is also available from the website shown on this slide, considered three of the Exploring for the Future activities, which at the time represented about 40% of the budget. The analysis estimated the total potential benefits could be anywhere between 446 million and 2.5 billion, with a potential return to Australian government in taxes and royalties of between 92 to 632 million. You will agree that is a pretty good investment return and is also a positive endorsement of the government's decision to its in increase its investment for a further four years. Now, I will, would like to briefly touch on what our focus will be over this four-year period. Now, in general terms, it will include activities across Southern Australia, complementing the work undertaken in Northern Australia during the first phase, and will focus on two transcontinental corridors, one in the east and one in the west. Both these corridors are considered highly prospective for minerals, including critical minerals, energy resources and groundwater, including areas with significant potential for agriculture. Earlier this month, the government announced the eight projects it will be undertaking, and these are also outlined up on this slide. Now, I will hand over to Karal Charnotta, the Senior Advisor for the Exploring for the Future program, and he will talk in more detail about the exciting science being undertaken and the, what the program is looking to answer. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Christina and Andrew, uh, for that introduction. First of all, I want to uh, start by looking at the program logic. Uh, you've heard quite a lot about what the program is trying to achieve, and we've come up with a little bit of a cartoon or a snapshot in terms of how we want to get there, uh, in terms of uh, our journey. So on the left-hand side are the science and data activities that we perform. This is what we get busy with on a day-to-day -day basis. The majority of the people here are scientists, and we're dealing with the scientific information and data sets. We deliver, we deliver up outputs, and I'll highlight what they are in a moment. Uh, but we do all of this to realise outcomes and impacts. And I want to take you through this cartoon, starting from the right, from the, where, from the place that we want to get to, and move back uh, to, to the left-hand side. So starting on the right, uh, the impacts. You've already heard, we want, a, we want a prosperous Australia where industry is thriving and we're maximising uh, their, our opportunities. We want to have a, a renewable sector which is thriving in the transition to a lower carbon future. We want water security for all communities and for industries. And we want informed decisions uh, by everyone. Now these things, to achieve them, normally take quite some time from the time that we acquire information or provide knowledge to actually realising these things. So I'm just going to give you a snapshot of just how long that is. We're going to go back to 2013, and in that year, we released a study on salt lakes. We were looking at the surface and groundwater and what elements they store within them. It was actually motivated by trying to look for lithium, a critical mineral, uh, which is used in batteries. But it turned out, unlike Chile, we had 
almost no potential for that. It turned out, though, that we had lots of potash. Potash is used in fertilizer. In a previous assessment that we did, it turned out that if we did have the list of critical minerals that Australia is strategically dependent upon, it would be on it because we're a net importer of potash. So we're going to zoom into this region in the red and have a look. Um, what we provided is effectively a multi-criteria assessment. We fused lots of different data sets to see which regions are prospective. And they come up in these reds and greens and so on. The, red, the warmer colours are more prospective. I'm going to talk to you about Lake Wells and Lake Way. As Christina said, we commissioned a study to look at the future benefits of the Exploring for the Future program, and they were quite staggering. And we thought, hmm, we should probably also commission a study looking at what are the actual benefits of things that are very close to realisation or have already been realised. So this is the story of this particular uh, investment. In 2012, we began the Salt Lake study. In 2013, we published it. In 2015, two years later, we were contacted by a company called Goldfire Resources, uh, who were a gold explorer uh, in the region. Uh, in August, Goldfire Resources uh, reported potash in their exploration tenements after reading our uh, report, and they shifted their focus towards the potash industry. In 2016, it actually changed its name from Goldfire Resources to Australian Potash realising the opportunities uh, the, that are at hand. In 2017, it, identified a, a, it undertook a scoping study, and in 2019, a feasibility study. And at the moment, it's forecast to start production in 2023. Now, a neighbour of um, Australian Potash is Salt Lake Potash Limited. On the right-hand side is a picture of their developments. They are actually scheduled to start producing uh, sulfur of potash products, which are kind of the premium grade fertilizers, in the June quarter 2021. And that's at Lake Way. But this particular study by Ansel Allen focused on Lake Woods. Um, it realized that GA invested $2.7 million into the program, and it estimates that the returns from it to Australia are between 158 to 254 um, million dollars. Like for every dollar the dollars that the government spent, the return will be 154 to 254 dollars back. That is huge. It's staggering. Just to the Commonwealth alone, that benefit ratio is one to 65 to one to 93. That's the, 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 those are huge returns, uh, and it seems as if we're realising it. And we would say that either directly or indirectly, we have jump-started that particular industry, which not only is providing great wealth but also supporting Australian agriculture uh, in the process. But that took 11 years. So that's kind of, we're starting to realise those benefits. Well, let's have a look at another study in terms of outcomes. And uh, here we're talking about, well, when do you actually make the discovery? You could see that um, Australian potash made it after a few years of the report, I think one after they actually started working on it. So I'm going to show you another case study where we did an assessment of the potential for nickel, copper and platinum group elements across all of Australia. Again, we fused lots of different data sets together and we came up with this heat map. And uh, there's a region, we presented it at uh, just near Perth, and uh, there's a region about 70 kilometres north of Perth that lit up red on the map. And I remember being there and the company said, oh, come on, you know, surely we would know, it's just northeast of Perth. And we said, well, you know, have you looked? I said, well, it's so close. Surely we would have. And we thought, well, under our assessment being uh, consistent across all of Australia, we think that it's probably worth, uh, we're, we're worth a look. So uh, when Ansel Island did this report, and it's released today, and you can go to, the, uh, to, to our website uh, to receive it, um, it, uh, it, it came up with this particular timeline of events. In 2012, uh, we began the project. In 2016, we published it. So four years of work, just compiling the data sets and doing the analysis by a team of quite a few people. Uh, in early 2018, tenements were taken up by Chalice Gold uh, in that region. The first drill hole uh, commenced in 2020. And look at the staggering growth in the share price of that company. And that's because the first drill hole hit sulphides it turns out that the primary uh, metals here are actually platinum group elements, so they're part of these critical minerals 
uh, again. Uh, so it's platinum group elements, nickel, copper, cobalt, and gold in this particular one. We spent about 1.6 million on this study. Uh, the uh, benefit uh, multiplier is between 1 to 160 to 525. But there is speculation uh, on the stock market this might be one of the top 10 discoveries of this sort. Uh, we want to hear from Chalice about how the drill out is going. And the return to, common, to the Commonwealth was between 50 and $150 for every dollar spent. But exploring for the future hasn't been going for that long. But I suppose what I want to make the point is that we've got runs on the board. I've, I've spoken about some runs on the board in the minerals area. There are runs on the board in the groundwater area also, where the work that we have done that is published is influencing policy decisions uh, and considerations in Queensland, for example. So you heard from Andrew uh, that industry has taken up. They've started the investment. In other words, they're in here in this one to five kind of phase that we want to hit, where they're starting to pick up ground, starting to get active, starting to put drill holes uh, down in exploration. Uh, I think we've achieved so far in the Exploring for the Future to have a very strong engagement and a trust of our data sets. Because you don't pick up over, uh, uh, over 100,000 square kilometres of tenements uh, without people trusting you. It's an area greater than the size of Ireland, the whole country, over the last four years. I've never seen, uh, I suppose, successes like this in my time at GA. And also, they've been picking up, uh, I suppose, new technologies and new insights that we're trying to transfer uh, to industry. So, what are the outputs that lead to such successes? Well, we've got three main categories. On the left is the portal. This is our uh, so it's flagship delivery platform for data sets, but not only data sets, but also decision support in terms of where should we go to explore uh, in the future. How do we fuse different data sets together? How do we visualize them in three dimensions? In the middle uh, is an example of one of our outputs. It's the extended abstracts volume. There's 62 contributions in it, and you can read uh, them to your heart's content, and they link you through to other publications that have occurred during the last four years of the program. On the right-hand side is an example of one of the highlights. So this is the highlights uh, report or program update from the first phase of the Exploring for the Future program. And I'll point out how you can stay in touch with us at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the seminar. Okay, so moving on to the, our bread and butter, the science and the data sets that we do. We don't want, it turns out that providing just data sets, while it's useful for some people, it turns out that it's very useful for us in order to make sure those data sets are useful, to work out how they can be used to uh, infer the resource potential in a region. It keeps us sharp, and it also helps to highlight opportunities across Australia. We have effectively two categories of this. The first is geological potential. That is, where are the rocks that have the potential to host different types of commodities? Where are the aquifers, for example? And recently, over the life of the Exploring for the Future program, and last week we had an excellent talk on this uh, by Laura Easton, uh, is economic fairway mapping. In other words, it's not enough to just provide the geological framework. We also want to know whether, it's, whether the projects or the areas that have geological potential for resources are going to also be economically viable. So moving further back in the line, uh, in the Exploring for the Future program, we are focused on understanding minerals, energy, and groundwater systems. That is, what are the processes that function in order to concentrate those uh, commodities in order that, that we may be able to use them uh, in an economical manner? So our data sets can be used for a whole series of other applications also, like, for example, natural hazards, uh, infrastructure hazards. Uh, but in this program, we are focused on minerals, energy, and groundwater. So what do we mean by systems? So I want to talk through this, because this is really the glue that holds the integration of different data sets together for us. You can conceptualize a system as a source of the resource. You might cast your mind back to understanding groundwater problems in geography uh, lessons. It's rainwater. We might think, oh, well, that's very simple, right? Like, I mean, we don't need to do much work for that. It turns out that's not actually the case. Australia has some of the longest flow paths in groundwater in the world. The water in certain areas that comes out of the ground is over a million years old. It's not enough to put out a bucket for a few years, even um, a, a few decades out there, to work out what the time series has been, how 
um, rainfall has varied in order to charge up those aquifers. In other words, it's a scientific problem which actually requires dating of those groundwaters. What are the pathways? How does that water flow through it? It's a key unknown in, main, in groundwater studies. That is, what's, what is the sedimentary facies? What's the distribution of rocks in the subsurface or sediments in which the water flows? What are the traps? What's the, what's the architecture? How is it organised? The places where the water rains and then flows through. And what's the driver? Well, it could be that there's just topography and, uh, and we're flowing downhill, but we also can have confined aquifers. In other words, systems understanding becomes very complicated very quickly. But these few simple questions help us to shape our thoughts and minds to get towards an understanding which is useful in its application. If we then focus on energy, uh, conventional gas, uh, for example, the source is organic rich shales. Right? These organic rich shales are here in black in this particular cartoon. And the pathway is the whole architecture of the basin, the distribution of rocks and their structures. The traps are geological structures in this particular case. Uh, that could be changes in, uh, in lithology and other types of systems. And the driver is you actually have to bury those source rocks to a certain temperature to start generating oil. Uh, it's uh, about uh, 50 to 150 degrees uh, Celsius and beyond that gas. So we need to understand how the geology has evolved through time. And in minerals, uh, we want to look at, uh, uh, we look at much deeper systems often. Not, not, not always, there could be shallow things like the salt lakes, uh, for example. But other times, we look all the way down to 200 kilometres. So groundwater was focused at about a kilometre depth, um, petroleum systems about five kilometres, although you still need to know about deeper structures in terms of the, that temperature change. And in minerals, uh, in this particular system, the magnetic nickel that I showed you the example of, the source is actually the mantle. So we've got the rigid tectonic plate, and underneath it, we've got the stirrings, the convecting uh, rocks beneath it over geological time. The pathways are structures within the lithosphere, that is within the Australian plate, where the magma has to find its way to the surface. The traps are sulfidation reactions up in the very near surface. So we, we scavenge sulphur from sediments and things like that in order to concentrate the deposit. And the drivers are actually increases in temperature way down there at the base of the plate that generate melting. So the point is, it's a thrilling study. All of this requires a deep understanding of the distribution of the geology, all the way from the surface, because that's the exploration search space for the, for, for, for the minerals area, all the way down to the very base of the Australian plate and even the stirrings beneath it. It's fascinating, and I think we're like pigs in mud playing around in it. So uh, moving back, so that's, that's the kind of process oversight that we put on things. But a lot of our effort, and you can see this wedge growing in this diagram, is spent on understanding just that distribution of materials and the ages of the geological units across Australia. So here, which you can see, is a myriad of different data sets. We're very proud of these. Uh, we delivered these as part of the uh, Exploring for the Future program. And you can see that the picture here just focused on Northern Australia. And what we want to do is expand that coverage across the entire continent. Um, we will go back into some of these and, and I'll highlight them later on in the talk. But I just want to highlight one of these. And that's because it's so mouthwatering. This is the Airborne Electromagnetic uh, Survey, AUSAM, uh, where you can see a picture of the scale of all, of all of Australia. Some of these lines that you can see in the, in the top right-hand corner, these little stripes, that's a flight line which is over 1,000 kilometres long that an aeroplane has flown to acquire information. It's charged the earth and looked at the decay of the signal. I'll get back, here, back into that in a moment. You can see really big features in this already. The red region, that's the Aramanga Basin. That's the Great Artesian Basin. That's the place where we find the dinosaur um, skeletons and things like that you see in the museum. And you can see lots of fine information around that. If we zoom in uh, to this, this is, a, uh, this is a wonderful animation from uh, Sebastian, who's been interpreting uh, this work. You can see the, the surface geology, and you can see the slices. And we start to see features there which are not apparent from the surface geology at all. Once you bring up all those slices, you start to have this x-ray picture down into the earth. 
We see beautiful faults. These are discontinuities between the rocks. We can see dipping sediments into those, into those faults. We can see paleo channels, and we can also see other conductors, which may be indications of where should we follow up in terms of our exploration if you're looking for minerals. The paleo valleys for, for groundwater, and the sediments who tell us uh, about the structures and the evolution of basins for hydrocarbons. And if you overlay the sediment, uh, the, the surface on it again, you can see that a lot of these features you just don't see just by looking at the surface. So the challenge for us is how do we explore at depth and how do we characterise the geology there and we're biting the bullet on that one. Okay, so moving back, the last bit is toolbox, data sets and toolbox. This is where the majority of our time goes into. This is the acquisition. This is the quality control to make sure that it is robust, fit for purpose, that you can trust with, uh, with confidence. It's about the codes that we develop. It's about bringing everything into the digital realm so it's easily used by uh, our communities. And I just want to show you just one highlight, harking back to that Oz AEM survey. So what that survey was is a fly, uh, an aeroplane has flown and it's induced a current. These are milliseconds along the x-axis and this is the current in through here. So every 40 milliseconds you get this particular behaviour and you get a sounding about every 12.5 metres along the flight pines, which are over 1,000 kilometres. What you get from that is the decay of, uh, of the signal within the earth that has been induced. Uh, one is in the direction the aeroplane flies, and the other one is in the vertical direction. And what we then try to do is using these little data points, these oranges and blues, with an apply, we try and infer, or an inverse method, to try and work out what the real structure of the earth is, which is the picture on the right. That's some deep maths, right? This is what you're seeing here is actually the first time that this particular technique where you can see full uncertainty has been applied to the Tempest system, which is the one that acquired those really big uh, profiles that, that I was showing you. So it's innovative stuff, and it leads to continuing development and improvement of this technology, which is so crucial for Australia. Yet this is only one example that I'm showing you. This, is, this sort of depth of information sits in so many other areas of Australia, and not just geophysics, geology, and geochemistry uh, also. So, you might think, my goodness, 20 kilometres. Like, I mean, when I go for a walk, I walk over a few different hills before I get to 20 kilometres. Can you really get a picture of Australia if you have information every 20 kilometres? This is a wonderful trick that you can apply. This slide shows you. The black lines are the flight lines. They're about 20 kilometres apart, and they're deviated because we go over drill holes. The little, um, the, the, the colour that you see is differences in conductivity. They're actually being inferred by a machine learning algorithm, which learns the relationship between the conductivity and the myriad of other data sets that we have. And the stripiness at sand dune country, and the, uh, you can see beautiful rivers uh, across through here. So in other words, while we don't have data, we can do a pretty good job inferring it. I'm not saying the job is done, we can do much better, but it's amazing what we can now get out of uh, the data sets as we apply ourselves to them. And we can scale this to the scale of Northern Australia. So on the left, bottom left-hand side is what you would get if you were just interpolating uh, between those flight lines. You get these blobs. The middle picture uh, shows you what you get if you apply machine learning. A much crisper, clearer information uh, with uncertainty associated with it. On the right-hand picture shows you the real versus the predicted values, and we get about a correlation coefficient of about 0.4, which is staggering. Really good. All right, that brings me to the end of talking about this particular program logic. So I hope you can appreciate that while a lot of the things that we show are at the pointy end of where the resources are, there is a lot of grunt work and fastidious organising of data set that goes on in the back end in order to see these outcomes that... that, that, that um, uh, that we're also, uh, I suppose, inspired by. But you've come here to hear about the new projects. So this is what I want to talk about now. Uh, there are eight of them, and six of them are focused on spatial areas in Australia, and I will focus on those. So the first one is the Barclay Eyes of Georgetown project, or BIG for short, uh, for us. It's really, in it's focused on minerals and energy. So in each one of these, you'll see a symbol for which, which system and which part of the geological column it is actually imaging. It's the area that we've been working in in the first phase. And we've continued here because we want to finish well. All right? 
We don't want to leave things uh, half done, uh, so to speak, and then we want to take the insights that we've gained from that area and apply them to the east. We know that the region between Mount Isa and, and Georgetown, uh, there has geological affinities, and we, want to be, and we want to be able to use the insights that we got from the first phase in order to, to roll them out. So here I'm going to, uh, the, the key challenge uh, in this particular project is how to open up a new a resource province. This is a region that had very few drilling. It's completely undercover, this region between Tenon Creek and Mount Isa. We collected heaps of information over it and we combine it into an inference of what is the um, resource potential in that region. This is an example of a map of the iron oxide copper gold potential and it highlighted a corridor uh, across the area. And in this corridor, there were only four wells in the central region. That, this is, just happens to be one of them that's listed there. We use that information to infer what the geology sits undercover. And based on those inferences and, now, and, uh, and the data sets that we've provided, industry picked up all those tenements. But we wanted to test whether our inferences were correct. Not only our inferences in minerals, but also our inferences in hydrocarbons. But here I'm going to focus on the mineral story because the hydrocarbon one is still coming out. Uh, so stay tuned on that one. So these dots here on this map show you the distribution of the drill holes uh, that, that we undertook. And this is the wonderful core that has come out of, a, of that work. It is beautiful. There's a big variety of different types of, uh, of lithologies, which means that we can get a great insight into what sits in the subsurface. But importantly, we get to test our hypotheses and our assumptions. And the staggering one on the right is, uh, is one on pyrite, charcoal pyrite, and isopyrite veins, uh, which have copper and... Uh, and arsenic in it, and most likely gold, they've gone out for assay. So we've used that information uh, in some places. We thought, great, this is wonderful. We have real evidence of the sign of a mineral system being present in that area, and that's probably the best incentive that we can give uh, for exploration uh, to proceed. But we also learnt that our estimates of the geology in certain areas uh, weren't correct, and we changed the solid geology in those regions. So you can see the differences between the maps on the left and the right. And as we carry out these projects and as we test our inferences, that's why it's so important to do so, that geological map of Australia is continuing to grow. So moving on, uh, another project is the Officer Musgraves project. It spans the uh, Western Australia, South Australia border and creeps into the Northern Territory. It's predominantly focused on energy and groundwater and mostly focused on characterising the surface and the uh, sedimentary basins and aquifers in that area. The key challenge for the groundwater across the region is that remote communities in the area are mostly reliant on fractured rock aquifers. And it's a questionable whether you could use groundwater to support agriculture across the region. What's interesting is that the South Australian government, together with CSRO, carried out a, a study which I did identify that there is actually pockets of good um, potable water resources across the region, yet um, that study has come back um, through an interview with ABC with the regional areas is, well, what volume do, do we have? How can we best manage it? Those are the sorts of questions that this program is trying to do and extend uh, that type of work out towards the west. What you're seeing here uh, in, uh, in the region is the really dark yellow colours are paleo valleys. These are old river channels which have now been filled in with sediments. The blue dots are drill holes across the region. You can see the area that we're focusing, this kind of odd kind of T-shape, uh, is an area which has sparse drill holes and few of them go into those paleo valleys uh, regions. The way that we're going to go about this to work out whether we can sustainably use the groundwater resources in the region and uh, support um, agriculture in the communities is by acquiring electromagnetic uh, data sets across it, downhill geophysics on most likely existing bores in this particular region, and undertake groundwater sampling. The region I was just showing you uh, was spanning this particular region in through here, crossing over an area which is called the Officer Basin. Uh, the, um, the Officer Basin is a huge um, intracontinental uh, sedimentary basin. It has been previously explored, but by global standard is way underexplored. And what's really interesting about it is that 
many of the wells that you see on this particular side have shows of uh, hydrocarbons in them. In other words, we know that the system has worked. The source rocks have actually generated hydrocarbons, but so far we've failed to find economic accumulations of them. So what, what, what can we do to help this? It turns out that we actually don't have direct evidence across the main inferred depot centre, so the areas where the basin is the deepest uh, uh, across this region. So what we can do is we can image that basin and we can also undertake some drilling uh, across it to see whether we have thicker um, source rocks across the region in order to make the system viable. But not only that, exploration across the region has been hampered by the um, understanding of how the geology from the western side where there's lots of wells and the eastern side where there's lots of wells, how they gel together. And that's one of our expertise, is to kind of look at the correlations and kind of systematization. You can always view that, currents, that the currency of geoscience is the stratigraphic units. So it's very important that we keep growing that understanding because it's the key to understanding the processes. So moving along, the next project is the Darling Kunamona de la Marian. It's predominantly focused on groundwater and minerals. It will be focused on imaging the entire um, Australian plate from the surface down to its base, to great depths, and it spans New South Wales, South Australia, Victoria and New South Wales. It's a large project. I'm going to start off by looking at the groundwater uh, scenario here at, uh, at the, um, uh, the Darling River uh, and, uh, and this particular part of it, between Vilcania, Burke and towards the east of it. The, uh, the project region is highlighted by green in through here and the backdrop, the colours, is the topography that you're seeing. What you notice about this is it's a part of the Darling River which actually incises into bedrocks. There is a fairly narrow channel that the river passes through. In this region, we care about supporting communities and industries. But specifically, the challenges here are in terms of salinity of water resources. Currently, along the stretch of river, there are uh, management plans, uh, um, salt interception schemes from groundwater, where you pump the groundwater, put it into an evaporating pond, in order to let the surface river water run through and not become too saline. All right? So obviously, understanding what the distribution and where, you know, where we can optimise the distribution of, the, of, of such, a, uh, uh, such schemes is an important uh, thing across the region. And also, some of the towns across the region have uh, struggled during periods of drought in terms of potable water supply. And what you see in this graph on the bottom left is the volume of water that comes down uh, the river um, versus years. And you can see it's a story of droughts and flooding rains. So how, do we, how can we cope with that type of scenario? So I've been talking about the, the key scientific challenges. Another one is shown by the, the image on the bottom left. It's again an electromagnetic image across the, uh, across the river channel. Uh, the red is areas of groundwater where we have saline water in through here. The little blue bit is actually the river channel. And what you'll notice is that it's actually quite narrow. It's only about one or two kilometres or so uh, across the region, which normally in these parts of river systems, we start to lose fresh water down into, into the groundwater regions. So the question is, why is it so narrow? Is it being controlled by the geology? How is it being con controlled to, to the geology? How can we manage this best? across the region. And the blue region up in through here on the further eastern side is actually exposed fresh rock. So in other words, all blue regions are not just water. You need to understand the interplay between what water is sitting in the pore space and the geology. And the plant activities here, uh, we're going to take a scale reduction approach. In other words, first we're going to acquire some airborne electromagnetic uh, data, then some surface magnetic resonance surveys, which can work out what the level of the water table is, what the, uh, what the hydraulic properties of the, of the rocks are in that, uh, in that area. And then we're going to follow up after those two surveys, which are progressively being targeted, one using the other, with eight um, drill holes. They're going to be paired, and one of them at least is going to be sonic. In other words, you can get pore water out of the pores from it and calibrate the geophysics. Uh, and then we're going to uh, look at the geochemistry and dating for the purposes that I talked about previously. The, Kunimo, uh, the Darling Kunimono de la Marion project um, 
uh, is it's so large because of the geological features that we're trying to investigate. So the Delamarian region is an arc. It's about um, 120 or so million years old, 110, and it spans all the way from Tasmania uh, through Victoria and into New South Wales, and recently uh, similar related rocks have been reported in South Australia. In other words, this arc, which is generated by magmatism from a subducting downgoing plant, uh, slab, this is what this cartoon shows, has been ripped apart and there may be ribbons further to the west across the region. And the question is, what is the potential for, I suppose, uh, convergent margin mineral systems? So the bottom left here shows you these are the rocks, uh, the Mount Reed volcanics, um, uh, the Stavely region in Victoria, uh, the Mount Wright volcanics in the Delamarian, and in them we know that we've got already deposits and sniffs of these uh, of these types of mineral systems. One is v VHMS, volcanic host massive sulfides, copper, lead, zinc, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, there's been very successful projects we carried out in Stavely where porphyry copper deposits uh, are, are being worked through to um, uh, are being drilled out uh, for, for development, and there may be potential for nickel, copper, and PGEs. But importantly, on the eastern side, we know the whole thing has been actually squashed at a much later time, and that brings with it gold. So we want to also understand, has there been a gold overprint? And what has happened uh, to all of this uh, across the region? If you unveil the geology and you look at the geophysics, you'll see that that region has, and I've shown just that outcrop of the rocks, um, you can see it sweeps around the Kunamona kind of nugget. There's a, whole, there's a thick, hard core of material in there. That's where Broken Hill sits. There's potential fine oxide, copper, gold, sedimentary-hosted lead zinc that have been extensively metamorphosed. Um, and it sweeps around. So how has this arc been segmented through time? What's the depth of the cover of this region? Is the fertility of these rocks the same across the entire region? Those are the questions that we want to ask. And we want to be able to zoom in onto the regions uh, that, we, that we can explore in most. So that's the Delamarian component. The Kunamona one is focused about how do you specifically explore through cover in the best way possible. What we're doing there is we're extending the Kunamona magnetic lyrics cubed to the east, which is currently in South Australia, to cover also uh, New South Wales. And we're looking at specifically how can you explore things in terms of how do the signatures of uh, elements seep through the cover so you can use it as a tool as opposed to a foe. Right. So the last one that I want to cover is Australia's Future Energy Projects. Uh, sorry, no, second last one. Um, this is a national scale project focused specifically on energy and specifically mapping basins. The key challenge is, is how do we unlock the potential of uh, undercover basins uh, across the region? And specifically, it'll start focusing on basins which sit on the eastern side of Australia, which cover this uh, confluence of states. Um, these basins are... Uh, we want to look at for the hydrocarbon scenarios in them also, but also more generally at uh, what are non-hydrocarbon resources, such as hydrocarbon, carbon capture and storage, uh, deep groundwater, and even uh, sedimentary hosted mineral uh, occurrences. Interestingly enough, the basins here, the oldest ones, they start when the Delamarian arc arrives. In other words, the geodynamics are linked. So clearly you can see links between these projects uh, forming. I'm going to show you a cross-section across this area. What you can see here is the Aramanga, or the Great Artesian Basin, and beneath it there's a whole series of stacked basins, one on top of the other, and again that question of how do the rocks from one region to the other correlate, how do they compare, are they the same type of basin or not? So we're going to be focusing on that um, very acutely. In terms of, um, we also want to know about uh, the residual oil zone and liberation using uh, carbon dioxide enhanced recovery. So we inject CO2 to get more uh, hydro, uh, hydrocarbons out uh, from the rocks. And that's already being applied in some basins, but these are the frontier basins that we want to assess as part of this particular uh, project. And then on the National Groundwater Systems Project, uh, the key challenge is Really, how do you develop a national understanding of groundwater? It's, uh, we haven't done it uh, so far. It's been a long time since we've released anything uh, national. Last time that was 1987. And really, we want to work very closely with the Bureau of Meteorology on this one, uh, because they are the ones that hold the, 
uh, I suppose, the geofabrics information on the groundwaters, and we want to provide that systems understanding, the geoscience uh, that puts on top of it. So questions like, where are groundwater resources? And what are the characteristics? Which regions most require improved groundwater system understanding? What is the most up-to-date geological knowledge on the shape and location of aquifers? What is the connection between them? What is the best practice in order to sampling them and assessing them? So we're going to do this through a phased uh, approach. So uh, the really big <laughs> project around this is Australia's resources uh, uh, framework. Um, this project focuses on minerals, energy and groundwater. Again, it focuses across the whole lithospheric column. And what it is doing, it's effectively trying to build that national understanding of the distribution of rock properties across all of Australia in 3D and possibly 4D as we add uh, understanding of time from the geochronological aspects. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to highlight a few of these things uh, that we're currently focusing on. In terms of soil science, we're trying to merge all of our data holdings across all of Australia. We, um, we're uh, we're analysing something on the order of over 60 elements uh, across these. And some of these surveys, if you tried to tie them, they're, they're, it's a mishmash. But importantly, the dark ones here, we already have in our sample uh, collection. And we've only analysed a few of the elements. So with new techniques, we are getting them reanalysed now. And that's great, because we can get on with things in the COVID times. We're looking at heavy mineral concentrates across all of Australia with the National um, uh, uh, geochemical survey uh, data sets uh, in collaboration with Curtin University, which will tell us there are certain pathfinder or key indicator minerals about certain mineral systems which might get from drainages, which highlight new regions for exploration. And we want to take all that information, fuse it together with um, hard rock uh, data to come up with grids. So like you're used to seeing the grids of Australia's uh, magnetics and gravity, we want to do this for the elements of the periodic table using the, the machine learning approach that I showed you applied to airborne AM data. Here it is applied to iron oxide uh, concentrations. Importantly, we want to be able to uh, strip away the geology. This is what we were able to achieve in uh, the first phase, and we're going layer by layer to reveal what lies beneath the, uh, the layered sedimentary basins of Australia. And we want to stack them in three dimensions. This is where we've got to so far, and what we want to do is we want to be able to have the entire country stripped of its main layers, the, main, uh, the era boundaries, uh, by the end of the program. And in terms of that big AM survey, our plans are to go and acquire it in these light blue regions. So going deeper into the crust, we'll continue to advance the isotopic atlas. Currently, we're in the process of uh, compiling the, the data sets across, uh, across Victoria. Um, we want to bring in magnetics and gra gra gravity inversions and extend them across all of Australia because they're such a key component of our mineral potential. Extend the metamorphic map across all of Australia and in terms of the lithospheric mantle going right down to the, to the, to the depths, this is uh, the extension of the collaborative Auslan project. The grey regions have been acquired, the purple ones were done under the first phase of exploring for the future, and the red ones are, we're currently in discussions. They may well change with the states as we have, uh, as we have those conversations, but you can see an increasingly um, beautiful picture of Australia emerge. And going even further down, the passive seismic looks all the way down to the base of the plate. Uh, what we're trying to do here is do the ambitious thing of setting out seismometers spaced 200 kilometres apart to form a backbone for the uh, passive seismic data across all of Australia, and so that we can map important surfaces like the lithosphere sphenosphere boundary, which we learned controlled uh, sedimentary hosted deposit distributions in the first phase. So we bring all of those bits of information to understand mineral systems. So the ones we're going to be doing is extending the iron oxide copper gold assessments, improving sediment hosted base metal assessments, particularly focusing on sampling of the basins which are highlighted in the dark areas uh, on the bottom left, and and also undertaking an alkaline rock synthesis. So what's the distribution of alkaline rocks and their associated mineral systems, including critical minerals? And on that note, we are also have a focus on mapping out the distribution of mine waste, tailings dams. Uh, we're using work that we're doing with our colleagues in the United States Geological Survey uh, and Canada in order to infer what the critical mineral contents in them may well be and actually go and test that with some sampling of them. We bring all of these things into the portal in three dimensions, um, so you can have the whole, I suppose, gamut all in one place, and we've actually started. We're getting on with it, and COVID isn't stopping us, and the places to get information are here.
access uh, the portal, the program information, email us to let us know what you think of our work program, and stay tuned for signing up to the newsletter. Thank you.